Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. This is Conservation in the Classroom, where you get to interact with one of WWF's very own experts or scientists. My name is Kate, and I will be your host. Today, we are joined by Dr. Nikhil Advani, who is the Director of Climate, Communities, and Wildlife here at WWF. Nikhil is going to talk a bit about how climate change is impacting species around the world and what him and his team are working on to help address these impacts. So Nikhil, thanks so much for, for being here. We're really excited to have you. Great. Thanks for having me, Kate. And thank you to everyone for joining today. I'm excited to be here to speak to you. So before we kick things off with Nikhil, we of course have to introduce our special guests that we have joining us on camera today. So when it's your turn to say hello, make sure you make some noise so everyone can hear you. So first up, joining us from Crow Agency, Montana, we have our fifth grade class from Crow Agency. There they are, looking good. Next up from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, we have Miss Stump's class from Gettysburg Area Middle School. Oh yeah! That was, that was good. <laughs> um, next, from Fox Hill, we have Miss Foster's fifth graders. <laughs> awesome. And last but certainly not least, we have Miss Fontaine's fifth graders at Irma Siegel Elementary in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Oh, they're muted. <laughs> oh, no. Let's try that again. We didn't hear you guys. One more time. That's that's more like it there. Okay, well, we are thrilled to have all of you joining us and can't wait to check in with you during the Q&A. Quick reminder for those of you that are watching off camera, make sure you use that Google form that you should see under the video to place any questions that you have for Nagil during the presentation. And we'll try to incorporate as many of those questions as we can at the end. Real quick, before we get started, some of you may have seen this, but if you missed it, we posed a trivia question while we were waiting that we would love for all of you to en enter your answer into. You can see it going across the bottom of your screen there. Head over to slido.com and you're gonna enter the password wildlife climate to answer our word cloud poll question. So what we were asking is what animal do you think is most affected by climate change? So make sure you head over there and Enter your answer. So, I think we're ready, Nikhil. If you're ready, I'm ready. Yep. Cool. Okay, so let me go ahead and share our screen here and we will be ready to roll. Okay, so before we get started, um, I think it'd be helpful, Nikhil, if we can kind of start by talking a little bit about you and what you do at WWF and yeah, just kind of introduce yourself to everybody. Yeah, sure, thanks, Kate. Um, I'll start off by saying, I don't think I've ever had an audience that's that excited before. So <laughs> I'm really happy to, to be here and do this today. Um, so my name is Nikhil Advani. I was born and brought up in Kenya, in, in East Africa, and I lived there until I was 16. I then studied in England, and then I moved to the U.S. Uh, to the University of Texas at Austin to do my undergraduate degree, and my, I went on to do my Ph.D. there as well. I graduated in 2012, uh, worked for the Nature Conservancy in Texas for a year, and I've now been at WWF for eight years. And my work at WWF is focused on how climate change is impacting people and wildlife across the world, and then trying to develop and implement solutions to help them deal with those changes. So that's what we're gonna talk a bit about today. Okay, that sounds good. Before I advance here, I just wanna make sure, hold on, everyone pause for just a second. Technical difficulties. I just wanna make sure our audio is connected. Okay, I think we're good now. So if we're talking about climate change, obviously today, um, I think it probably makes sense to kind of start with global warming. 
we can't really talk about climate change unless we talk about global warming. So what exactly is global warming? Yeah, very good question. So the concept of global warming, uh, it's also sometimes called the greenhouse, yeah, greenhouse effect. And the reason for that is that it's very similar to a greenhouse. If you have a greenhouse, um, which is made of, of these glass walls and you have sunshine, the sun uh, um, and the heat energy from the sun enters the greenhouse and the greenhouse traps some of that heat energy inside. And that's why the greenhouse ends up being a lot warmer than it is outside the greenhouse. And, and this is what's happening on Earth. So it, it's a natural phenomenon on Earth. Without the greenhouse gas layer that surrounds the Earth, we wouldn't be able to live on Earth. It's too cold. But the issue is that for over 100 years now, humans have been emitting greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, which are making this greenhouse gas layer more and more concentrated. And because of that, energy from the sun is, is coming into Earth and more and more of it is being trapped inside the Earth. And that's what's causing global warming. Um, and then global warming in turn has, has these knock-on effects on things like rainfall patterns, um, which is why collectively we refer to it as climate change. Okay, that makes sense. So. I think this map here is going to show us a little bit about how things have changed over time. Um, if it will play for us here, it's working earlier. Um, <laughs> anytime it wants to work would be great. Um, if it doesn't play, then we'll just move on. But um, how have things ch changed over time exactly, Nikhil? Here we go. Is this a recent problem or like? Yeah, so I mean, the history of, of global warming goes back almost two centuries ago, where, where we first realized um, that there's this concept of the greenhouse gas layer. Um, but over 100 years ago was when this scientist called Svante Arrhenius was the first person to suggest that human emissions of greenhouse gases were actually leading to global warming. Um, so we've known about it for a long time uh, and the problem is becoming worse and worse. Uh, and that's what this animation shows is, is how much the entire globe has warmed over the past hundred years plus. Gotcha. So, I guess our next question is, what is actually causing this to happen? So what's causing these gases to get trapped in our atmosphere? Or what's responsible for releasing all of these gases? I have a feeling that a lot of the students that are watching have some ideas about what's causing climate change, what's causing global warming. Um, we've provided three sound clues to kind of give you some hints of three of the big ones. So have a listen at each of the clues and see if you can figure out what cause we're indicating here. Here's the first one. So that was your clue for source number one. Here's your clue for number two. And last but not least, here's another contributor to climate change. See if you can figure this one out. So did you guess correctly? <laughs> you can double check, see if you got those right as to the three causes that we're referring to here. In that first sound clip, you probably heard what sounded like a lot of cars, probably stuck in traffic. Um, Nikhil's going to tell us a little bit more about that, but that has to do with fossil fuels. The second sound clip was the sound of a chainsaw chopping down trees, which obviously was a hint of deforestation. And the last one 
found it probably like a lot of cows, a lot of farm noises um, having to do with agriculture. So Nikhil, can you tell us a little bit more about these three? Yeah, um, so burning fossil fuels, which are you know things like gas, which you use to fill up your car, or uh, coal, which is used to power many power plants, which provide our electricity, emits all these these fossil fuels emit various greenhouse gases. Um, the most important one is carbon dioxide, because that's the one that's being um, emitted in the largest quantities and is the biggest contributor to global warming. Um, deforestation is another big contributor to global warming because trees, um, like, like all plants, absorb carbon dioxide when they photosynthesize. And when we chop down these trees, we're taking away more and more sources um, that are absorbing carbon dioxide. And then the last one is agriculture. Uh, so agriculture has, has many reasons why it's contributing to climate change. And one of them is cows. Um, so the amount of land that's taken to, to grow the cows, that's taken to grow food to feed the cows, and also methane emission from cows um, is a big contributor to global warming as well. So now that we have a little bit more of an understanding of what's creating the greenhouse gases and how they're causing our planet to warm, let's switch to talking a little bit about the effects of climate change. So starting with heat waves, can you tell us about heat waves, thank you. Yeah, so in terms of the effects of climate change, we, we're seeing quite a bit happening around the world. Um, it's, they're becoming, th these impacts are becoming more frequent and more extreme. Uh, one of those is heat waves, where we're having temp um, periods of, of excessive temperature that is far above normal. And um, you know we're seeing records being broken all over the place. So just this year, Death Valley recorded the, the highest temperature ever recorded um, on Earth, possibly, at 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and these records are constantly being broken. Wow, that is that is very hot. Um, what's this that we're looking at as another effect of climate change here? Yeah, so another thing we're seeing is drought. Um, I mentioned earlier changing rainfall patterns. And when you have rainfall that is uh, much lower than the, than the usual amounts, over time, that contributes to what we call drought. Uh, and so parts of the US, like California, and the southwestern, southwestern U.S. in general have actually been in a period of drought for the last decade or two. Um, there's been periods sort of in between that time where they've got some respite from it, but it's been a very long-term drought. Um, and these might actually just be the new normal in, in that part of the country. And then on the flip side of things, Yeah, so the other thing is flooding, um, you know, basically the op almost the opposite of drought, where you have too much rainfall. Uh, and this is something that we're seeing all over the world, uh, same as drought, same as the heat waves. Um, and the issue here is that you just have excessive amounts of rainfall in a short period of time. And so one example here in the US was Hurricane Harvey, uh, which hit Texas a few years ago. And that hurricane dropped 33 trillion gallons of water um, in one go over a few days. Uh, that's the amount of rainfall that Houston would typically get in the course of a full year. Um, so these extremes um, of flooding and hurricanes are becoming um, more severe as a result of climate change. Now, these effects of climate change are obviously not just impacting people, they're impacting wildlife, which is primarily what we're here to talk about today. So can you tell us a little bit about how they're affecting species in particular? Yeah, so, you know, we did that, that vote at the start about which species are most impacted by climate change. And unsurprisingly, polar bears were, were the top answer. Um, polar bears are the poster child for the impacts of climate change. And 
The reason is because they need the sea ice. They need the sea ice to hunt, uh, to mate, to make their dens, um, to, to move around the place. And because the sea ice is melting, they're slowly losing their habitat. Um, and this is a big issue for polar bears and many other species that are dependent on sea ice. And in the top left there, you can see um, that red line shows you what the average sea ice extent would be. Um, and then the actual sea ice extent, uh, This I think this image was from last year when we had the sea ice minimum, is a lot smaller than that. Um, and this has been happening every year now for the last two to three decades. Wow. Um, let's see here. And what's happening with elephants? So one of the issues, one of the other impacts we talked about from climate change was drought. Um, and drought is a problem for species that have very high water requirements. Uh, and elephants are one of those species. Uh, they need 150 to 300 liters of water a day just for drinking. And when water, when rainfall declines in availability, um, it's a problem for these kinds of animals. Um, and they can actually die because they don't have enough water um, and they also don't have enough food because the food that they eat um, depends on the rain. Now, your job at WWF involves projects that help animals adapt to some of these problems. So today, can you take us through um, these three projects that you've been working on with tigers, with African penguins, and with one-horned rhinos? And we'll start with tigers. Sure. Um, so this project we're doing in Thailand, um, and the issue here, it, again, is drought. Because of drought and, and the lack of rainfall, there isn't enough water and food available um, for animals like gore, which you see in this picture, um, and, and other animals like deer. Um, and all of these are, are animals that tigers need to feed on. So because the, the prey numbers, these animals are not high enough, um, the tigers don't have enough food. So what we're doing is we're restoring the habitat. Uh, we're providing, we're, we're, we're restoring the, um, the grasslands so that these animals have grass to eat. And we're also providing water in the form of artificial ponds, like you can see in this picture. And the idea is that this will increase the numbers of these prey and also increase um, the amount of food available for tigers. And I think we have a, a quick video clip that shows, this is from a camera trap in, in this national park in Thailand, and it shows uh, wild gore feeding. So it looks like it's working. <laughs> yeah, um, we, I mean, the, the project just finished recently and um, we're, we're seeing, uh, I mean, it, it'll take time, you know, we, it'll take a few years actually for us to actually see the, the true effects of it. Um, but we are gonna be monitoring to look at that. Awesome, sorry if there was a little lag in the video there. Um, Next up is obviously what you've been working on with the African penguins. Yeah, um, so African penguins, um, you find them in Southern Africa, uh, and this project is focused in South Africa in particular. And the issue here is that penguin breeding success has been suffering, um, in part due to, to heat waves, also due to um, storm surges from the ocean because these penguins are, are nesting right along the coast. Um, and because of that, the, the survival of chicks is reducing. So we're, we're doing this project in South Africa with a partner that is, is trialing a few different things. Uh, one of them is these artificial nests. Um, and the artificial nests are a way to, to increase the breeding success of penguins and as a result, um, attempt to increase their resilience 
to think to those changes that I mentioned, to the heat waves, um, to the flooding. I think we have a little video here too. <laughs> so that penguin seemed to have taken to the nest okay. <laughs> Yeah, again, that project is also ongoing. Um, and it's we, do, we don't actually even have the final report in yet. So so like these all these other projects, these are all recent projects. And and you know, the success of the project will be measured over the coming months and years. Great. So I think the last project that you're going to kind of dive into a little bit more detail with us today is um, the one horn rhino project. Yeah, um, so the issue here with these rhinos are, are in Nepal and they are, are vulnerable to severe flooding. And when it floods in this part of the world during the monsoons, the flooding is so heavy that in, in, some, in, part, in years past, the flooding has actually washed away rhinos. Uh, there was one year where I think 12 rhinos got washed away across the border into India um, and some of them died as a result of that. So the, the idea here is to build these huge artificial mounds that will be a refuge uh, for rhinos and other wildlife during times of severe flooding. Um, and that's what you're seeing in this drone footage. You see the, that it's a very flat landscape. This is in the floodplain of the river. And if there is severe rainfall and flooding, um, this provides a place for the animals to escape to um, while they wait for the flood waters to go down. So I know you mentioned that these projects are all ongoing. So obviously you and your team will continue to monitor their success and monitor um, how the populations are, are thriving. So are there any other projects that are kind of on the horizon for you that you're excited about? Yeah, we just kicked off three more projects this year. Um, these projects all fall under um, this umbrella that we call the Wildlife Adaptation Innovation Fund. And the three new projects we have this year are for tigers in Nepal, uh, for birds um, in a desert in South Africa, and for tapirs in Mexico. So all these projects just got started over the last few months. And we'll be doing a call for new, new projects um, soon, within the next one or two months. Well, that's very exciting. Um, I know that a lot of us that live far away from animals like this often wonder how can we help them from our home or school or community. We sometimes feel so far away. So what are some suggestions that would, you would give to everybody of how they can help? Yeah, there's many things that we can do in our everyday life. Uh, you know, one option is, is rather than taking a car somewhere to, to ride a bicycle or to walk, uh, I do that every day. I walk into work and I walk home and it, it's a 30 minute walk each way. Um, turn off the lights when they're not being used, unplug devices when they're not being used because just even just being plugged into the wall uses up electricity. Even if you're not, let's say charging a device or even if the TV is off, it's still using electricity. Um, conserve water. You know, many of the, the climate change impacts that I talked about had to do with, with water availability. And so when you're brushing your teeth, for example, you can turn off the tap. Um, there's many easy ways that you can save water. And then also um, in your, you know, even in your backyards, you can plant, uh, you can plant plants um, that attract pollinators. You can plant trees, which help to, to absorb carbon dioxide. Um, these are all things that, that you can take, actions that you can take in everyday life. Um, and all of it adds up, it all makes a big difference. Um, and one last thing is food waste. You know, food waste contributes a lot to climate change. And so you can be much more conscious about not wasting food 
um, and also composting any food that is wasted. Those are all good tips and I think all things that we can all do in our everyday life. So that actually brings us to the end of the presentation. So if we wanna kind of pause there and revisit that trivia question that we had posed in the beginning, um, Nikhil, I'm sure you're curious as to what everyone thought was the most affected animal by climate change. So let's have a look and see what everyone's answers were. You think it's polar bears? Probably. Probably. You might be onto something. If you can see it there, polar bears is in the biggest letters. So that had the most answers contributed. I see actually some penguins and seals in there as well. Someone wrote humans. How about that? <laughs> yep. Humans is a very important one. You know, we didn't talk about that today, but there's a lot of people around the world that, that are feeling the, I mean, we're all feeling the impacts of climate change, uh, but some people worse than others. You know, there's many communities in, in places like South and Central America, Asia, Africa, that depend on farming as their main livelihood um, to feed themselves and to make an income. And their farming um, is just being completely disrupted by these heat waves, by drought, uh, by changing seasonality of rainfall. Well, thanks to everyone that contributed an answer. I think all those answers are definitely valid. So we appreciate your, your feedback there. And I think it's time for Q&A. So for those that are joining us on camera, our special guests, just a reminder, when it's your turn to ask a question, make sure you get up right in front of the camera and speak nice and loudly and clearly. And for those that are watching on the website, remember to enter your questions in that Google Doc or in the Google form, and we'll try to ask as many as we can. So. If we are ready, let's go ahead and bring our first on-camera guest here, which is our group from Crow Agency, Ms. Michael's class. If you guys are ready, what is your first question that you have for Nikhil? Why do other places that used to have water have no water now? Yeah, I mean, I think I wouldn't say that places don't have water. Um, but what we're seeing is we're seeing changing weather patterns where some parts of the world are getting a lot more water. Other parts of the world are getting a lot drier. But I think the biggest thing is that it's becoming very unpredictable. Um, so, you know, there's places where we work where they have a really severe drought for two to three years, and then all of a sudden they have really severe flooding. Um, and so it makes it very difficult for us to plan. We can't know that one place is going to get drier or is going to get wetter. And instead, we have to plan for all this variability that we're seeing. That was a great question um, to kick things off. Next up is our group from Gettysburg, Ms. Stump's class. Go ahead. I was curious if any specific habitats have recently changed dramatically. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think we're seeing change in many different places. There's one that that comes to well there's the polar bear and and the sea ice right is one that we think of because every year we're seeing this decline in sea ice but the other one that we didn't talk about are corals um, so you get corals in the ocean and because of warming temperatures in the ocean we're consistently seeing um, corals do this thing called coral bleaching where they become very white and, and eventually they can die and it's because of these warm ocean temperatures. Um, and so that's one of these shifts that we're starting to see a lot more of. Um, you see it happening very frequently um, in many places around the world. That was another good question. Um, okay, Miss Foster's group from Fox Hill, you are up next. Um. How much longer do you think it will be until all the ice melts in the ocean? 
That's a very good question. Um, it's going to be a long, one thing you have to realize with sea ice is, so we find it at, at the poles, right? You find it in the North Pole and the South Pole. And in the winter, in both those places, we're going to have sea ice for a long time because it's so cold over there in the winter, we, we will have sea ice for a long time. The thing we have to worry about is the summer sea ice. Uh, and in the Arctic, which, um, you know, the North Pole only has ice. There's actually no, no land over there. Whereas in Antarctica, we actually have land. But in the North Pole, it's only sea ice. And it's thought that within a decade, possibly, as early as the 2030s even, there could be a few weeks in the summer where that sea ice completely disappears. Um, again, when it gets colder towards winter, it will start to come back. Um, but there is a chance that it could disappear for a few weeks. Uh, and over the years, that, that period where the sea ice is gone could become longer and longer. Okay, and Miss Fontaine, our group from Irma Siegel, it's your turn if you're ready with your first question. What makes you want to have the job today? Sorry, can you repeat the question? What makes you want to have your job today? Oh, <laughs> um, I love my job. Um, I, from the time I was a kid, I've always loved nature uh, and animals. And I knew that I eventually wanted to work in wildlife conservation. And, um, and I love it. You know, I, I now get to, to work with, with animals all over the world. Um, and also people in, in many different countries. Um, and it's, it's pretty amazing to see what people are doing around the world to help wildlife and, and nature. Um, and I'm, I'm just very lucky that I get to be a part of that as well. So we're gonna pivot and ask a question or two that were submitted from the website, if that's okay with you, Nikhil. We have a couple good ones in here. Um, Carter in Louisiana was interested in knowing where do the polar bears go when there is no ice? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So there's actually 19 different subpopulations of polar bears. And some of them stay on the sea ice throughout the year. But there's a few of them that, that actually go on land every year um, during the summer. So when the sea ice declines in the summer, um, they'll go to places like Greenland uh, and Canada, these countries that, that border the Arctic. Um, you'll see them in Alaska as well. Um, the problem is that as more and more of the sea ice melts, more and more of those uh, bears and those subpopulations will be spending time on land. Um, and that will become a problem because it also means that they're encountering humans more. We have another good question. I'm gonna sneak in another one from the, the website here um, from Ryan at Jefferson Middle School was wondering how storms in the United States are affecting the wildlife here. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, you know, we're seeing extreme sort of storm surge, particularly in coastal areas. Uh, let's say during hurricanes, for example, um, you're, you're finding that that these storms are more intense than they used to be, um, partly because of sea level rise. So sea level rise is another consequence of global warming. And if the sea level is higher than it would be normally, all of a sudden when you get a storm, the storm is that much worse. Uh, and that is having an impact on a lot of um, coastal marine species. So it, it, so it also impacts corals even though they're underwater. Um, it can impact uh, animals like sea turtles uh, by destroying their nests. Um, and, you know, we also have, but we also have natural defenses to those kinds of things. Um, and mangroves are one of those very important natural defenses, mangrove trees, um, which is why it's very important for us to, to keep mangrove trees um, and possibly even plant more of them because they provide a really important um, barrier during these extreme storms. Okay, 
Um, I think we're ready for another round from our on-camera guests. So we'll go in the same order that we went the first round. So first up is Ms. Michaels' group from Crow Agency. What is your second question? What is going to happen to the polar bears when there's no more snow? Yeah, that, you know, that's a question that, that we don't know the answer to. Um, bears are creatures that are, are quite uh, adaptable. You know, they, they, they've managed to live in, in many sort of different kinds of habitats. If you look at different bear species, they eat many different kinds of things. Um, the worry for polar bears is that polar bears really need food that has a lot of fat, um, like seals. And if they don't get that uh, food, we're not sure how well they will survive. Um, so when the sea ice disappears, you're not only losing the ice, but you also lose those other species that depend on the ice that the polar bear feeds on. Um, so, so that could become a problem, but the truth is we don't know yet. Um, I, the best scenario is that we don't let it happen, that we address climate change and we don't have to deal with a world where there's no more sea ice uh, and all the polar bears are on land. Okay, our group from Gettysburg, Ms. Stumps class, you guys are up. Go ahead. What is something that is personally fascinating to you from your research? Wow, that's a, a good question. Uh, a loaded question, Nikhil. <laughs> I know. Um, I have to, to think about that a bit. Um, I think... I, I would say something that I did not have as much of an appreciation for before I joined WWF was just how closely intertwined people and wildlife um, and nature in general are. And for all of the work that we're doing around the world, you have to make sure that, that both people and wildlife are benefiting from it. Um, you know, in a lot of the countries we work in, if you work just to save the animals and the people suffer because of that, then those solutions are not going to work in the long term. So everything we do, and this is particularly true for climate change, has to be solutions that benefit both people and nature. Um, and I think to me, as someone who, before I joined here, you know, I was just a biologist and I, I actually used to work on butterflies for my PhD. And I don't think I fully had that appreciation um, of just how closely interconnected um, the two groups are. That's a great answer. Uh, Ms. Foster, Fox Hill. Okay. So you taught us like the impact of animals. So what are the effects or like, what happens if, for humans? Yeah, very good question. Um, you know, humans are, are also being being affected by, by many of these, these changes in climate that we talked about, right? We talked about heat waves. Um, there's been multiple cases of, of people actually dying because the heat waves have become so extreme in some parts of the world. Um, and the same thing goes with flooding. You know, the flooding is so severe that, that people's homes will get destroyed um and you know people can also get swept away in floods like, like i mentioned about the rhinos uh, and a lot of my work is in africa and, and in africa that the real impact we're seeing on people is the changing rainfall patterns and that's really affecting their ability to farm uh, and to grow crops like they used to it's becoming a lot more difficult for them and miss fontaine's group your next question. So if um, agriculture, burning fossil fuels, and um, deforestation are the main causes of um, climate change and stuff, is any of those the ones that are killing frogs? Because the numbers of frogs are quickly dropping. So which one of those is killing frogs? Or if it's any of those? Sorry, can you repeat the last part of the question? Um, if it's any of those, um, which one is killing frogs? Any which one is? 
So what cause of climate change is um, affiliated with the decline in frogs? Oh, right. Um, very good question. So frogs are, are amphibians. And amphibians are actually one of the, the most affected groups of animals uh, because of climate change. Um, amphibians breathe through their skin. And that, uh, you know, there's various ways in which they're being affected. Uh, one of them is this thing called a chytrid fungus. And this chytrid fungus covers their skin and, and it affects their, their breathing. Um, and then it just affects their life cycle in general and, and they die from it. And we think that this chytrid fungus is, is actually spreading because of changing temperature conditions. Um, so we've actually had some species even go extinct, like the golden toad. And that we think is in part due to climate change. Um, so that's a very good question. As far as those different causes of climate change, deforestation, um, fossil fuels, agriculture, we can't really tease apart which one is having more of an effect. It's basically just climate change as a whole that's affecting these species. Okay, I'm going to take another uh, question here from the website, and I am keeping an eye on the time. It's already like at that time, if you can believe it. Um, so we have a few others that um, submitted through the chat here. So I'm going to try to sneak in one or two. Um, Jean from Moreland Hills Elementary was wondering if they're doing projects to create actions to help endangered species, are there any species that you would recommend that need the most attention that they should select for their projects? Yeah, wow. I mean, it, it kind of goes back to the question of which animals are most affected by climate change. And we asked that question to see what, what people's reaction would be. But the truth is, there's a lot of animals and plants out there um, that are being affected by climate change. And, and obviously, some more than others. Um, but to be honest, it's, it's really hard to prioritize which ones need more attention than others. Uh, it, it's really hard to say. Also, because there's a lot of animals that are, um, that are not in the public eye. You know, like I'm really glad somebody asked that question about frogs because amphibians are a group that's really being affected by climate change, but a lot of people don't hear that. Uh, there's also a lot of plants that are being affected by climate change. Um, insects, you know, butterflies. I, I did my research on butterflies and, and they are, are really being affected in, in many different ways by, um, by the changing of the seasons not being what they used to be, um, by high temperatures, by drought. Um, but a lot of people don't hear about these species. So I think it's, I think the most important thing would be to educate yourselves on the many ways in which climate change is impacting um, both wildlife and people. That's a good answer. And I think um, I'm going to add just this one last question that got submitted from the website, um, just because I know it, it's a big question, but I think a lot of people think about this sometimes. It's um, a question that got submitted from Everett in California. If there is a possible way to save the earth from climate change. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, a big that's question. The thing with, with this is right. We have all the solutions to it, and we just need um, people to enact those solutions. So, so the most important actors are governments. Um, and the big corporations, you know, they're the two that control um, the most resources and, and have the most influence in the world. And we really need to, to take drastic action to reduce our burning of fossil fuels. You know, there's amazing alternatives like solar and wind energy that we need to adopt more quickly. Um, and then also many changes are needed to, to, agri to animal agriculture in general. Uh, we need to stop cutting down forests. So all the solutions are there, um, but it just me, it, we just need people to actually, um, you know, take that action and, and turn it into something meaningful. Um, I think at the moment, a lot of people, a lot of governments, a lot of corporates are saying the right things, but we actually need to see action on the ground. Um, and I think this is where you uh, as individuals are very important. You know, there's, we mentioned earlier the actions that you can take in your everyday life. 
but you should also be talking to people about this. That's one of the most important things you can do. You know, after the class today, when you go home, speak to your parents about this, speak to your siblings about this, speak to your friends about this and, and let them know what's happening and what an important issue climate change is. Um, and the more we can get the word out there, um, the quicker we can address this problem. So, so I do think it's something that, that we can address in our lifetime, um, but we need to act fast. Well, I appreciate all of you that submitted questions. I can't believe we are at time already. Um, I am just going to share just a little bit more information to kind of close out before we say goodbye to everyone. So for those interested, um, teachers, parents, guardians, if you're interested in more learning material around this topic of wildlife and climate change, you can find it on our Conservation in the Classroom webpage. You should see a link to a material packet right underneath the description for Nikhil's event. Within that packet, you find all sorts of materials, including a collection of Kahoot games, um, a science activity that you can do at home or in your classroom, links to different information, including um, the WWF ADAPT learning courses that are, are really helpful. And I know we ran out of time quickly today. So if you do have more questions that you would like Nikhil to answer, you can go ahead and email them to wildclassroom at wwfus.org and we'd be happy to get some answers back to you. And last but not least, make sure to mark your calendars for our next event coming up on November 17th at 12.30 p.m where we will be joined by Monica Turkelson. Um, she's gonna share a bit about her experience out in the Northern Great Plains and really kind of show how we are all related and give everyone a new perspective of our relationship with nature. So we're gonna bring everyone in one last time to say goodbye. Thanks everyone for being here. Thank you.